By the end of the 1930s, there were hundreds of potato chippers across the country. But with World War II looming, there were dark clouds on the horizon. With the war came numerous government restrictions, including controls on private and contract haulers and limits on production of shortening and oil. There was great fear that the potato chip industry might have to cease production for the duration because its product was not considered essential. NOS and a special committee put together a list of 32 reasons why potato chips were essential, then went to Washington, D.C. and sold the concept to the bureaucrats. By the time the consummate salesman headed home, the potato chip industry was not only deemed essential, but the association's members were allowed to obtain enough raw materials, gasoline, and tires to continue. The association's first foray into government relations was a roaring success. There would be many more successes in the years ahead. The war ended in August 1945, and as the industry geared up for a big push, there were still lingering technical problems. While hand cooking was giving way to continuous fryers, manufacturers were still packaging chips and other snack products by hand. Daniel Woodman, working as a consultant to Herman Lay, developed the first preformed bag machine, and the industry was on its way to packaging automation. The immediate post-war period also saw a spurt of new entrepreneurs in the business. In 1946, one of them was Jim Herr, who decided to leave his father's farm and pursue the American dream. With $2,250, most of it borrowed, Herr bought a small potato chip company in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Operating out of Nottingham, Pennsylvania, it would eventually become one of the nation's leading regional companies. In the early 1950s, two new snack products were added to the industry's portfolio cheese-flavored extruded corn puffs, and pork rinds. There were now six salted snack products to offer retail customers. But the thing that put potato chips and other snacks on the map was the TV tube. In 1950, Americans owned 1.5 million television sets. A year later, that number swelled to 15 million, and the number continued to grow until most households had multiple sets. The impact on the industry was huge. Folks sat around the tube, munching on snacks. Meanwhile, the NPCI, which later became the Snack Food Association, continued to grow. Organized in regional groups, there were nine domestic regionals and one in Canada. Each regional had a meeting or two each year, bringing together manufacturers and suppliers in a venue that fostered the kind of networking that is still the association's hallmark. The regional concept was eventually abandoned, largely because of increasing travel costs that required major vendors to attend too many meetings. SFA was reduced to an eastern and western regional, then finally to one national meeting a year, which is called Snackspo. The 1950s became bonanza time in the industry, with the Frito Company acquiring several large regional companies. Meanwhile, Herman Lay was moving quickly, building plants throughout the southeast and acquiring pretzel and potato chip plants as far west as Los Angeles. In 1961, the industry was stunned when the Frito Company and H.W. Lay Company announced a staggering merger that created a $135 million corporation which forever changed the face of the industry. Elmer Doolin never lived to see the accomplishment, having died in 1959 at the age of 56. In 1965, PepsiCo would merge with the growing snack company to create a beverage snack giant. The snack industry was not only growing in the United States, but in Europe as well. George Crumb's invention first spread to England in 1921, then later to France, Germany, Italy, Switzerland, Holland, and other countries. Over the years, would-be chip producers paraded to the U.S. and, with the assistance of Harvey Noss and his staff, visited welcoming domestic chip companies to see how it was done. Noss was a frequent visitor to European snack companies, as always, digging for new members. In 1961, at a historic meeting in Frankfurt, Germany, the European Regional was formed as part of what now had become the Potato Chip Institute International or PCII. By 1964, the European Regional had 88 members, and even the Russians invited Harvey Noss behind the Iron Curtain to talk about potato chips. 
In 1978, the regional would become an independent group called the European Chip and Snack Association, which is now called ESA for European Snack Association. By the middle of the 1960s, snack sales had reached three quarters of a billion dollars in America. Another new product would quickly push sales over the billion dollar plateau. One day in 1964, Arch West, marketing vice president for Frito-Lay, was touring retail outlets in Southern California. At one store, he noticed a number of greasy craft paper bags on a Frito-Lay rack. Inside the bags, he found little pieces of toasted tortillas. His first reaction was that if people were buying stuff like that, maybe Frito-Lay should be making it. West went to Alex Morales of Alex Foods, a tortilla maker whose company made tortillas for Frito-Lay's Disneyland restaurant to determine whether tortilla chips could be produced on automated equipment. Morales said yes, and several months later, Frito-Lay gave birth to Doritos brand tortilla chips in the West and Southwest to tremendous response. Doritos were rolled out nationally in 1966, and virtually every snack manufacturer jumped on the bandwagon. Very quickly, tortilla chips became America's second favorite snack. In the early 1970s, the snack food industry faced two threats, the first real challenge to the industry since World War II. Potato chips, now a billion dollar category, were being characterized by the nutrition community as junk food. PCII mounted a spirited campaign, hired its own nutritional consultants, and fought back. One key phrase in the campaign pointed out there were no junk foods, only junk diets. Potato chips and other salted snacks had a place in a responsible diet. By the end of the decade, with the leadership of the association, a large percentage of industry products contained a nutritional profile on packages. The other challenge came from Procter & Gamble and General Mills, both of which introduced chip-like products made from dehydrated potato flakes. P&G called its product Pringles. General Mills called it Chippos. Problem was, they called the products potato chips, to which regular manufacturers took great umbrage. They feared the new uniform chips would carve into the regular chip market. A Save the Industry campaign was launched with the accent on product quality. In a lawsuit filed on behalf of the industry, a federal court ruled that the newfangled products could be called potato chips as long as it was prominently displayed on the package that they were made from dehydrated potato flakes. Procter & Gamble eventually built Pringles into a major brand and became an important member of the association. As the association fought this battle, Harvey Noss retired and turned the reins of the association over to Larry Birch, a marketing executive who brought many new innovations to the group. They included a robust committee structure, which resulted in much more individual involvement to association activities. With more and more government legislation and regulation affecting the food industry, SFA moved its headquarters from the Cleveland, Ohio area in the late 1970s and set up shop in suburban Washington, D.C. to be closer to the action. As the snack industry grew, so did retail food marketing. The traditional small food markets morphed into supermarkets, which eventually grew to 60,000 square feet and larger. Snack food sections became cavernous, often stretching the width or length of a store. Convenience stores dotted the landscape in virtually every neighborhood. Then there was the advent of mass market retailers like Walmart, Kmart, and Target, which began to draw business from many established product categories like toys, small appliances, clothing, and others, including snack foods. SFA did studies and presented seminars to help its members understand the new dynamics of marketing to a widening customer base. With the advent of barcoding in supermarkets and drug chains, store operators and snack food manufacturers quickly had instant information on product movement. As computerized route management systems were developed to help the industry take advantage of this information and streamline their route operations, the association helped spread the word on how these new developments could make their operations more efficient and profitable. A lot of credit for the growth of the industry has focused on the entrepreneurial spirit of the snack manufacturers. But a great deal of credit must also go to vendors to the industry. Fostered by the incredible networking opportunities provided by SFA, the vendors worked step-by-step step with the industry in making technological breakthroughs which helped improve quality, productivity, 
accuracy and shelf life. As SFA celebrated its 50th anniversary in 1987, both the multi-billion dollar industry and the association were strong, and folks were bullish on the future of all products. That year, after the National Pretzel Bakers Association decided to call it quits after 47 years, SFA established a pretzel committee, which included all of the NPBI members, most of which had been affiliated with SFA. As the industry and SFA moved into the 1990s, it would be rocked by revolutionary developments that would change the landscape of snack food marketing and the retail food business, and set the stage for unprecedented growth. 